I rolled my own multi-agent orchestration software this weekend, and you're probably thinking, wow, that's stupid. Maybe it is, but I learned a lot. And so I wanna talk about the things that I've picked up from building a ton of different agents and agentic workflows, and then cover what I actually made. So first of all, why do this? It's because there's a disconnect between the steps and the software development lifecycle. And there's more to the story than just having your code written. I think a lot of people are obsessed with that one part, but you have other pieces. And so why not string them together? So one thing that I've learned is this pattern of continuation prompts when you are using one of these threads is pretty nice. And you can tie that to a hotkey. So I've done all these processes manually with Augment. And I was just curious, what could I do if I switched it up? Let's see, that's all live, great. So when I finish a thread, just quick tip before we get into the rest of the stuff. When I finish a thread, I will basically use a continuation prompt for the next agent to read for coding this up. After that, write a conventional commit and push to name of branch. And so it already is speaking the way I want it to speak. Yours may not look like this because I have story points assigned. I'm really going after this kind of scrum style thing. Now I hated scrum in real life, but because it's very objective and it has very strict rules around it, the LLMs tend to like it. And so I'll just grab this continuation prompt. This looks fine to me. And I will go into here and then I'll just click this and have it go. So that's gonna keep going. Now, when it comes to other things that I've noticed, with making my own is the variation that everybody has with their PRDs. So if you make a massive one, something that's over 20,000 tokens and it's all over the place and it's cross cutting, then you're gonna have a bad time because it's going to just struggle. It will start to deteriorate in terms of quality the larger that it gets. So that comes down to not knowing how to write PRDs to begin with. A lot of people just don't know what a PRD is and haven't done the job of a product manager. So you're trying to pick that up really fast and that's great. But a lot of the time you will just make decisions to break things apart even more and even more. And there's frameworks for that. One of them's called the spider framework. So I tested that out. I didn't think it was that great. So spider, five examples to split user stories. So this guy talks about spider where you split user stories using a spike. So a spike is a research activity that a team owner takes to learn more about some backlog item. And spikes can also give team the knowledge they need to split that story. Take YouTube for example, go back in time to when YouTube added automated captioning. The team doing that might have faced a build versus buy decision. Do they use commercially available software to generate the captions or are their needs so unique that they need to build something from scratch? The way to settle that would be a spike to test out one or more commercially available captioning products. Extracting a spike makes the original story smaller because some or all of the researched, research included in the original story is removed. Absolutely essential is split stories. So extracting a spike is one of the five splitting techniques you should use. So this is all about splitting. And you wouldn't want to use this if you were doing your PRD like in a one shot. It's just when you actually get some version of that, then you could choose whether or not you want to go and further split. So P is for path. This talks about how if you had a share button, when that pops open, some people might say, build a share button, use this thing. But there's 14 buttons in there. There's more to the story. You gotta build more stuff, right? And so he ends up finding 16 paths. Then you can split the user stories by interfaces. We don't have to think about this as much, luckily, because of V0 and these tools that are really good at thinking about it. But you still, if you're building production quality software for a bunch of users, it probably makes sense to have it not just one-shotted to look cookie cutter. And then you can split the user stories by data. And then you can split the user stories by rules. So. This is all about splitting. This is just one framework. 
if you want to, you go to Mountain Goat Software, and then it's in their blog, five simple but powerful ways to split user stories. So I've really leaned into the agile slash scrum stuff because I've recognized that in my past of moving fast and breaking things in startup land, that it doesn't work with LLMs because you're missing the talent that each person on that team had, which was to be able to think on their feet and not need the documentation because it's actually a waste of time. But if we're moving to a world where all of the execution of the code is done by these, then we are becoming orchestrators and we need to take all of that inherent knowledge that we had in our head and put it into documentation, into diagrams. So you can see in this example, I really like this project midday and I'm using it as a scaffold for my project VAI, which is the platform that is for our private network with people from Microsoft and Google and fast growing startups to learn how to use AI. And so I wanna build out something for them and for our community. And as a part of that, I wanted to follow this architecture. But when people think architecture, they don't realize there's more to the story than just, oh, what are all the individual components or individual pieces of technology that are used? So this is one of the many pieces of the puzzle, but this has a midday dashboard, which is Next.js. This has Superbase, which has different pieces within it, auth, storage, real time, a database. It has an attachment to React query cache. There's a TRPC client. There's a Hono setup. So you can work with external third party APIs. So you're using TRPC as a server internally so that you get that nice tape, type safety. And then for this middleware stack, how does that work? And then there's replicas. I wouldn't, I'm not doing that part. I'm doing most of this. But then you have the request flow diagram. So how do requests work? How do you deal with cash or transactions or security and headers or cores? How do you deal with context? How do you deal with verifying a JWT token, extracting a team ID? All of these things come into this diagram. How do you deal with auth? Because there's so many players within a system, if you have multiple clients and multiple servers, then how do you deal with that? And your projects will look simpler. I'm doing this because it's gonna open up the door for a mobile app and that's what I need but this same pattern would apply to your projects. How do you deal with data access? If you have different ways of dealing with data, what's the decision tree that the person on the team would inherently have in their head? But now that they're not writing the code and some agents are doing it, you need to get that out and onto paper, and in this case, onto docs. So this is the data access pattern decision tree. So is auth required? Is there real-time updates? How did we do with that? Where's log in and log out? In this case, you can see I'm putting the majority of it onto TRPC procedures, or if it's external, then it's a rest endpoint. And so you can also see the middleware, right? There's all these pieces. So a lot of people think of middleware if they're just coming from next world. Middleware and next is a misnomer. I can do a whole video on that, but there's more to the story there. How do you deal with middleware when it comes to security, rate limiting, scope validation, your queries, all that? And then what about for database routing? So there's all these things that go on. And then I'm just trying to templatize it and then put it into this system so that I can use whatever agent that I want. So if it's an augment remote agent, I'd love to be able to use it there and have just the outputs of my CLI tool give me the right things to say because I still want to lean on their context engine and have the option to. Or what about all the components just as a summary? So you can see everything in here to ramp up on a new project. And then I've put in an FAQ. So this is all for this particular project and it goes on and on. Why not use this? Why not use that and all that? So having this really helpful and then other ones, this is kind of explainer tree. So this is just more depth on how the whole system works. So what does the REST API layer look like? What does the TRPC layer look like? How does schema validation look in this particular project? So this is me analyzing a code base and then generating all these documents. And then the next natural evolution to that was, okay, how could I take this same thing that I just spent all this time on and then systemize it so that I can do it on every project. 
and move quicker. So that led me to building this idea processing pipeline. So I wanna have my idea that I write and I spend time doing research. If it's a zero to one project, so something brand new, then it's gonna look a little bit different. I can maybe go and do some deep research and figure some stuff out. But then I'll bring all that information in and there's a folder where as soon as I drop it into this ideas directory, it's being watched and that kicks off the pipeline. Now this is a work in progress, but I just wanna speak through it and get some feedback and then you guys can also go and contribute to it if you'd like or just fork it. It's available on a branch right now. As soon as that starts, and then it starts to generate the PRD. And it can generate the PRD with multiple different outputs. So there's a good Indie Dev Dan video that came out recently where he explains this nice thought around the benefit of having multiple agents work on the same thing to get multiple outputs at the same time. And so I'm applying that to all these steps or selectively to these steps rather. So for a PRD generation, it will go and write those PRDs based on a template that I have. So you can see that there's different prompts that are in here. So you have the idea to PRD, and this is in XML format, has all of the stuff that you need. So less human readable, but better in terms of performance if you read any of the Anthropic or OpenAI documentation on agents, XML is it. So this will run that, and then it will output it and we have a token limit on it. But at the same time, I wanted to be able to have it be crazy in depth. So I'm exploring this idea of smart chunking. So smart chunking is the ability for it to use the MCPs that are available that I've selected. So I have context seven for documentation on APIs and libraries, verifying technical details, the GitHub MCP. So this can be useful for post facto updates, but also looking in the past to see how things were done before it, doing actually the project management as well. So milestones, tying the milestones to the issues because we just want everything to be down to a science where it's like there's percentages, there's data values, there's validated inputs, validated outputs so it can know how far it's going. So eventually this could just be a thin wrapper on top of it where you're like, go do this thing, where are we at in the sprint? where are we at in the stories. And then sequential thinking MCP. So this will be for analyzing the PRD structure and identifying cross-cutting functionality and then dividing it logically into the chunks. And that's because the quality of the work goes up when you have less tokens. And conversely, it's vice, or vice versa, the longer the context, the worse the outputs. So I have all the tools that are available to this particular part. And then in this refs folder, I actually have all the tools and then what they do and their use cases. So you can see I took the documentation from those separate MCPs, made sure that it had access to all the different tool function calls and descriptions of each, and then the parameters for each. So it's gonna reference that and then come back, and then it will go make sure it's not cross cutting, and then it ends up making these different chunks. Right. So as we move through this, then you have the next step, which in Scrum, it is the stakeholder validation. So it validates the chunk for the team, which is defined here of the planner, the builder, the reviewer, the fixer, the product owner, and the critic. Just quickly, since I have that one up, the fixer is the one that's called if there's an issue in production. So that's for later. That's if something's going on, then we'll log an issue, immediately have that thing spin up a VM because this is using Docker and it'll be using Ader, which we have a config for that that allows you to select which model you want for each type of task. And then it can go fix itself and then spin down the Docker once it's done. So these things are ephemeral. They spin up, they spin down, they spin sideways. And yeah, so you just move through this, then you have stakeholder validation. So are there any ambiguities in these requirements? Can we get any clarification? Can we then figure out who's gonna do and validate this chunk of work for issues with cross cutting stuff? Because I want to be able to have five of the agents that are coding it go and do all five sprints at once. That's the idea where it's like, this thing goes, 
It's gonna take a lot of work to get it right, I'm sure. But for basic stuff I've been testing, it's working. And then you have the actual backlog refinements on Scrum World. That means generating the user stories from the validated PRD chunk by extracting the features, creating the stories of acceptance criteria, technical task, and estimating effort. That's probably what you're wondering. It's like, why do you have the effort estimates in it? But I think that also is just more data for it to think around. Like I've said in the past, don't ever have time estimates in there, but I'm realizing that it's nice because it's just another milestone for it. So if it says it's gonna be like, oh, on day one, do this, day two, do that. I've done five days worth of stuff before hitting the warning basically in one of these individual threads. So it does this for each story, list the three to five atomic tasks, the libraries and APIs, which are plussed up by context seven, and then the read only and writable file paths. So that is following a pattern that will then pass into Ader so that if there's things like the types that are auto-generated or the database schema, it will mark those as read only so that it can't go. It's basically putting guardrails on it. And then it prioritizes the story so it knows what to do to get ahead of that question where it's, here's all the things they think we should do. What's well, first? No, you already know, go do the thing. And then you get the output of that. It has its own sort of like front matter. So it maps to the story type, the written status, and then a chunk ID that's passed back so it can reference it. And then you get into capacity planning. So how many agents, how many of these things do we need to spin up as VMs? Not even separate VMs, because you can just do multiple shells in one. But I'm still obviously figuring this out. It's not done. I spent about a half day on this. I'm really excited about it. You get all these things that are passed in, and then ideally in the future, you can see, I want to have a running log of how this thing performs so they can see what capacity looks like, what are the diffs between what it's thinking it's going to take versus how long it takes and then error percentage. So that way we have data to then use for future either prompt enhancement or basically having a brain to know how this whole system works. And then you have the sprint planning. So that's actually taking all those different stories and then putting them together, making sure they're not cross cutting all that. And so pretty excited about this. This was the original kind of executive summary slash PRD for it. This is 16K tokens. And this was done with a bunch of exploration in Grok. I found Grok actually had a majority of the sauce compared to O3. I used O3 Gemini 2.5 Pro on the latest one from four days ago. Today's June 9th. And then Grok and just iterated through it. But yeah, the future for this is I'm gonna just keep working on that branch inside of the AI SDLC repo and get this part working. So this is one of three modes. So this is build mode, and then you'll have debug mode, and then you'll have documentation slash knowledge management mode. And that will include all of those templates that I teased at the beginning of the video where I talked about the different charts and stuff, like diagrams. That's one of 10 different templated essential documentation pieces. So that's it for today. If you guys found this interesting, if you think this is helpful, then like the video, subscribe, of course, if you wanna keep updates on this. I'm gonna be doing the kind of content roadmap for this channel is just straight up build logs like this. And I'll be peppering in the questions and answers as well. I'm already at 20 minutes. And on the main channel, three videos a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and that's actually more build stuff, but it's as I'm doing it. So it's a little more scripted, where it's like on the fly, like we're gonna build it together, whereas this is like post facto build log. And I hope you guys find this helpful. If you want to join us in VAI, you should check it out. We are launching this new platform very soon, hopefully this week, and I'll see you in the next one.